today on Living Power. They'll have wonderful programs, and there will be people who really enjoy each other, and they have good potlucks. Oh man, do they have good potlucks. But the church is irrelevant because God hasn't shown up, because there's conflict in the body. Live for God Studio Productions. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. So, uh, our passage today can really only be understood in the context of what Jesus is teaching his disciples. We're in Matthew 18, which is a chapter about kingdom living, basically, the kingdom of God. And it starts off with, uh, with the disciples. We, we looked at this last Sunday. The disciples had been arguing about who among them would be greater in, in the kingdom uh, of God. Now, they were probably thinking the messianic kingdom because that was the idea. If Jesus was the Messiah, and they'd already declared that he was the Messiah, they believed he was the Messiah, they believed the Messiah was going to set up his kingdom and bring peace on earth, and uh, Israel would be at peace, and, and uh, there wouldn't be uh, the Roman rule over them. And so they probably were, had this idea that at, at some point Jesus was going to set up this messianic kingdom and so they were arguing amongst themselves about who would be greater in this kingdom and it was a silly argument and a, and a dangerous argument because it was rooted in selfishness and arrogance it suggested that some of them were more worthy uh, than the other to be greater in the kingdom and so Jesus brings a child into their midst. Now they were at a house. It may have been Peter's house, as a matter of fact. And this may have been Peter's child, for all we know. But Jesus brings this child as an example and puts them in their midst and talks about comparing the child to the kingdom. And, and he says, uh, here's an example of who's great in the kingdom of God. And he taught them that to be great in the kingdom of God you have to abase yourself. You have to come as a child. You have to be humble. Uh, you have to be the most humble. In fact, the greatest in the kingdom will be the most humble. That's really what Jesus said. And, and, and that it's not about how great you are, but how small you are and how great your God is. And he tells us that we are to receive each other. And the word that's used for receive is a word that means uh, to, ex uh, to accept something as your own. It becomes your own. And I use the example, if I give you a $5 bill, and, and you take that $5 bill as your own. Um, and this is the idea that Jesus was saying, that we are to receive each other as our own. In other words, as one of us, that we belong to each other. We're part of each other's life. And... Uh, and in spite of the fact that we are all different. Now, God made us that way. Um, we all have a purpose and a plan within the kingdom. We're all so incredibly unique. Some of you are uniquer than others, but we're all unique. We all have our own little, uh, our, our own little basic um, design uh, from God, and it's for his purposes. But here's the key that we need to understand. It's not our differences that define us, but rather our common ground, our love for God, our love for purity and righteousness, and our love for each other. That's what defines us. In fact, Jesus said uh, in John 13, 35, by, uh, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So it was really important for them to understand and grasp that, that they needed to be as children, that the kingdom of God was really all about God, not about them. And then Jesus uses the example of the shepherd uh, that will search and search to rescue one sheep that is lost. And by that example, uh, he, he teaches us that our security and our position is in the kingdom of God. Is, and that that position and that security is not based on what we do, but it's based on what God does. Uh, discover your security in God. You need to understand that you are secure in God. Because when you feel safe with God, your faith grows. And as your faith grows, then you become bolder. And you start thinking about God's possibilities as opposed to your own probabilities. So the kingdom of God isn't about you, it's about God. And it's not about how great you are, it's about how great God is. 
It's, in other words, it's seeing ourselves in the light of his presence. And so today, as Jesus continues teaching about the kingdom of God, he addresses how to deal with those conflicts and those, those difficulties and those differences that come up uh, between the children in the kingdom of God. And there are conflicts. There are things that happen in our lives where we get crossways with one another and things fall apart and then there's, there's hurt feelings and then there's, there's a wall that goes up and it hurts the body of Christ. And he compares right away with the disciples, he compares the civility and the order of the kingdom of God with the law, the Judaic law that God had established through Moses. And it was important that he did that because the disciples were familiar with the law. They knew the law. They were aware of it. They were good Jews. They'd grown up being taught the law. And Jesus brings that law into a contemporary setting and applies that in a very practical way to that setting, and we see it as applied to our own setting today. So before we look at today's passage, I want us to take a look at that Deuteronomic law that uh, Jesus is referring to as he discusses this with his disciples, and it's uh, the law that gives us that foundation for what he's teaching. And here's what the disciples knew as law. It's Deuteronomy chapter 19, starting with verse 15. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses, uh, or of three witnesses, shall a charge be established. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear and shall never again commit any such evil among you. So this was the law that the disciples understood. And so as Jesus is teaching them this passage that we're looking at today, it begins to make sense to them, and they begin to understand it. And, uh, and so he gives, he gives them this, this new light, if you will, and he teaches them how to apply the law, the principle of the law, in the kingdom of God. And then in verse 20, he gives them a, a stunning, stunning promise, which we'll take a look at. Uh, so let's look at our passage. It starts in Matthew chapter 18, starting with verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two or Two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them, and by my it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Uh, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Now, what was Jesus teaching here? The basic premise of what he was teaching was that we're to come together. We're to come together when there is conflict and when there are issues in the body. How do we solve those issues uh, that that there, when there are conflicts between us and someone else, another Christian? Well, in verse 15, uh, he says, it's to, first of all, to be, it, it is to be redemption motivated by love. Redemption motivated by love. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. Now, to go and tell him his fault uh, has far deeper meaning than to simply go and tell somebody that they've done something wrong and that they hurt your feelings or that they've offended you. It's far deeper than that. The action uh, is, is the verb in this particular, uh, in this particular phrase uh, to go and tell him his fault. The, the word is uh, elenchio, which suggests that a brother actually comes under conviction for what he's done. So it's not about just telling, you know what you did? but it's presenting it in such a way that the brother comes under conviction for what he's done. And the aim is is not to lodge your complaint and prove him wrong. Rather, the intent is redemption, get this, redemption motivated by love. It is driven by love. Jesus taught earlier that we're to receive the fellow child as one of our own, and if he is one of our own, then we are motivated to be right with with each other. 
If you and I belong to each other, there's motivation in that, if we love each other, to connect and to straighten out the areas that are, are at odds, that we're, we're, we're at odds. And if we're not motivated to do that, then we've got bigger problems. And so uh, we are not to lord it over the other person, but we are to be equally right before God. The purpose of this is to be equally right before God. And remember, Jesus has said that the first trait of kingdom living is humbleness. And so you can imagine if it's hard to accept a rebuke, even a private one, uh, it's even harder still to administer a rebuke in loving humbleness. But that's what we are to do if there is a problem, a conflict, a difficulty between us and another brother, sister in Christ. Again, the disciples would have known this because it was part of the law. It was part of that, uh, that law that they knew so well. Leviticus 19, 17 says, You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. So, the first thing that Jesus says is if there's a conflict within the body between two people, then you are, t- you are to come together in redemption motivated by love. Redemption motivated by love. Remember, love comes from God. We're taught that. And love is allowing God to do something in somebody else's life through you. That's the practical application of love. Allowing God to do something in someone else's life through you. The second thing that Jesus teaches is in verse 16. He says you are to share the love. You're to share the love. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So Jesus teaches that if the private confrontation doesn't work, the next step, which by the way is also taught in the, um, in the Mosaic Law, uh, is to take two or three witnesses. Now, the assumption by many is that these witnesses uh, lend weight to the seriousness of the charge and uh, the seriousness on the issue, um, and they're there on behalf of the offended brother as moral support and also uh, to serve as witnesses before the church if it comes to that if the issue isn't resolved. But it really goes a a little bit deeper than that because these witnesses are to be people that knew of the offense or know the offense and perhaps even themselves have been offended. So it's not people that are just going, hey, can you kind of be my moral support while I go talk to this person? That's what, it's not about that. It's about people who know the offense and are there to try to get that straightened out also because perhaps because they themselves have been offended. But get this, these witnesses, these witnesses, um, oh, let me back up a bit. The phrase that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses suggests that these witnesses uh, may also have been charged or may have a charge against uh, the person, the offender. Now, get this, these witnesses do not have the right to participate in this attempt to resolve conflict unless they also come as the first brother, seeking redemption motivated by love. So in other words, if they're, if they're just there as moral support, they're there for the wrong reason. If they're there to seek redemption motivated by love, they're there for the right reason. And then Jesus says you are to, in verse 17, you are to protect the whole body, the whole body. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and as a tax collector. So finally, in verse 17, Jesus taught that if there is no resolution to the matter after the first and the second attempt, then the matter should be brought before the entire congregation. And if the brother that has committed the offense is not willing to settle the matter before the church, then Jesus says that the brother is to be treated as an offender to the whole church. He is to be treated by the whole church as having offended the whole church. Not just the brother or the brothers who brought the charge, but every member of the body. And this is a principle that's taught in the New Testament, that we are the body, the body of Christ. And if part of the body suffers, the whole body, of course, is going to suffer. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 24 starts this way. But God has so composed the body. Get that. God has so composed the body. This is by design. The church is by design. God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, so that there may be no division in the body, 
By the way, when it says giving greater honor to the part, it means greater attention. Great, uh, taking, taking better care of the body, in other words. The parts that, uh, that seem to lack that, that greater care. So giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. This principle is key for understanding how um, church discipline, but even how just personal conflict works. Because if I'm trying to straighten out a problem with another brother in Christ, I have to understand that brother in Christ is part, I'm part of the body of Christ, and so is he. And we're both hurting. We're both suffering. So if I have offended somebody, and, uh, and you suffer for it, I'm also suffering for it because I'm part of the body of Christ. I may not understand it at the time, but it's important for us to understand. That's how God so composed the body that way. That's what this passage says. God intends it to be that way, that we are to be the body together, and if one suffers, we all suffer, and if one re rejoices, we all rejoice. In other words, this suggests that each member of the body is to abide by the corporate judgment of the body. The body decides that this person has offended and doesn't want to straighten out, doesn't want to correct himself, then it, then it is to be as though he has offended the entire body. Now, it's important to understand the cultural context of this teaching. Back in that day, uh, there was only one congregation in a town, and it wasn't even a Baptist church. And there was one congregation, and this type of reprimand carried a great uh, deal of weight and bearing on the individual that did the offense. Nowadays, if a church applies that sort of discipline, most likely the, the individual would just leave the church and go to another church down the street. The principle that Jesus is teaching here is that in kingdom living, we all belong to each other. We're all part of each other. And if one offends another, that one offends the whole body and must be dealt with. Then Jesus brings out this glorious truth in verses 18 through 20. I love this passage. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. This teaching has sadly been completely taken out of context and completely misunderstood and mistaught. I've heard it so mistaught for, for so long. Uh, it's generally quoted to suggest that two people praying in agreement about something will have authority over the matter. Uh, the implication is that there's strength in numbers and if two or three gather and they pray for something that it will be done. But this passage is not dealing with prayer. In fact, the word prayer isn't even mentioned in it. It's not about prayer. Rather, what this is, remember it, take it, keep it in context. This teaching is that the two who agree are the offender and the one offended. That's what it's teaching. So it's saying that the, that the two who agree, the offender and uh, the one against the whom the offense has been uh, committed, and then the assurance then is that if these two individuals in the church come to agreement concerning any claim that they're pursuing, that it will be allowed, it will be ratified, it will be approved on by the part of our Heavenly Father. That's what the passage is teaching. So put it in the context of what Jesus is saying. This is about kingdom living. And that's the principle of the co in the context of what Jesus is saying. Then Jesus makes this stunning, stunning promise in verse 20. It's a promise that's made several times through the Gospel of, of Matthew, several times uh, through all of the Gospels, actually. But here it is, Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Now, it's really in, important for us to understand this. Uh, first of all, the word gathered means come together, come together in agreement. And what Jesus is describing is what he's talking about here is that his presence is dependent on that. Remember, in, uh, just as Jesus was described to Joseph by the angel, he was described as um, 
uh, Emmanuel, Matthew 1, 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus alludes to this many, many times through the Gospel of, uh, of Matthew. I will be with you. In fact, the promise is made in Matthew 28, which we'll see probably in about a year. Uh, <laughs> that, um, we will see Jesus say, uh, I am with you to the ends of the earth. He says, my presence will be with you. But there's, a, there's an issue that has to be dealt with here. It happens if the two or three are gathered in his name. That's where his presence is revealed. He will be spiritually present with not only the two or three that came to in agreement, but he is present with all his followers, and he's revealed with, to all of his followers when they are together in total agreement, when there is healing of conflict and disagreement. Do you see what I'm saying? When God reveals himself, it's because his people are together in agreement. You want to know why God doesn't show up in most of our gatherings? It's because his people aren't in agreement. There are disagreements and conflicts in the body. That's why there's no revival. That's why revival hasn't happened. We pray for a revival. Revival's not gonna happen until God's people come together in agreement. That's why churches are dying all across America, and by dying I don't necessarily mean ceasing to exist. Um, the numbers for churches ceasing to, to exist are really all out of whack. I've read that there's something like 10,000 churches a year are, are, are dying in America. It's, probably not, not that high. It's probably more like maybe about 5,000. But you have to understand that when a church closes its doors, that congregation just doesn't stop going to church. You know, they end up going to other churches, or they start another church, or they may start two churches. You know, it's, it's interesting how when a church, sometimes when a church splits, it splits and two churches end up out of the, out of the deal. So it, the numbers about churches, it's, it's really all out of whack. Don't get all bent out of shape when people start throwing those numbers around how all the churches are dying. They're not all dying, but they are, are in trouble. What I'm saying is that too, far too many churches in America, because of conflict among the body, in the body, far too many churches in America today are becoming irrelevant. They're just becoming irrelevant. The lives of the church members aren't really any different than the lives of the non-church members. And as a result, the church itself is becoming irrelevant. And I will tell you that we're seeing that happen. We're seeing that happen in Raytown, in Lee Summit, in Independence, in Kansas City, in Missouri, in Kansas, and on and on and on. It's happening everywhere because churches are becoming irrelevant because the members of the churches really aren't that different from the people that aren't in the church. And there's conflict in the church, as much conflict as there is out of the church. <laughs> That's the thing that tickles me. You know, I, I've seen neighbors get along better than some people in church. And it's, it's, it's sad that we, that we don't understand this key principle. Part of our job is to come together in the body of Christ. Kingdom living requires that. So let me make this painful observation. If your life isn't really any different than the people around you. If God is not making a difference in your life that radically speaks to their need, if you're not a light in the darkness of their life, you are irrelevant. And so may be your church. You see how important it is for us to come together we can't be used by God if we aren't together because God doesn't show up. He says, I will be together if you're gathered in my name. Then I am among you. How can churches become irrelevant when God promises that where two or three are gathered in his name, he's present? The church becomes irrelevant because the two or three are not in agreement and God has not shown up. Now they'll go through the motions and the emotions. They'll have wonderful programs and there will be people who really enjoy each other and they have good potlucks. Oh man, do they have good potlucks. But the church is irrelevant because God hasn't shown up because there's conflict in the body. 
It's sad to say that more people attend churches than God does. But the promise that Jesus makes is life-changing. This is verse 20. When you and I are in agreement, when we love each other, when we build our relationship on our common ground and our faith in Christ, when we build our relationship on our common ground and our faith in Christ, when we don't let our differences separate us, God shows up. That's a promise. That's a promise from God. Is there another fellow Christian that you are at odds with? Then don't expect God to show up in your midst. It's not going to happen. Because God said, if you're gathered in my name, if you've come together in agreement in my name, then I am among you. Over the next two Sundays, we're going to be taking a, a, a look at kingdom forgiveness. How does forgiveness happen within, within the body and between people uh, in the kingdom? Uh, in this class, we've studied forgiveness uh, several times, but it's important to understand the principles of kingdom forgiveness. How does that really work, and how do we apply that in our lives? And um, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit on this, but remember when we've talked about forgiveness in the past, I've told you that you are forgiven the way that God forgave you, or that you forgive the way God forgave you. And the way God forgives is he doesn't just blanket forgive. Nobody is just blanket forgiven for their sin. Jesus died on the cross and offered forgiveness for their sin. But there had to be repentance, and they had to receive that forgiveness for it to work. And the same thing is true in our lives. When there is some, some problem, some conflict that we have with a, another person, we have to be willing to offer forgiveness. But there has to be repentance and forgiveness. There has to be repentance and forgiveness. And if a person isn't willing to repent of their sin, then there's really no forgiveness. And God doesn't show up. So that's why this is so important for us to understand. This is what Jesus is teaching here is just revolutionary. I mean, these people had never really seen it in that light before. In fact, many of us had never seen it in that light before. But I want to close our study. Man, I've I'm, I'm got to quit letting you guys out so early. I want to close our Bible study together with this truth, uh, our, uh, with this truth from 1 John. If anyone says, I love God, I remember when Richard read that this morning, I went, hallelujah. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, by the way, the word hates is the word miseo, M-I-S-E-O, and it means misery. In other words, if anyone says, I love God, but is in misery with his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now I want you to see two things in that verse. Number one, if one does not love God, one is not motivated to love others. If you don't love God, if you don't have the right relationship with God, you are not going to be motivated to have the right relationship with other people. It's just not going to happen. I mean, you might have a relationship out of convenience. You might have a relationship because you want things to be at peace. But a, a healthy, growing, faith-based relationship where you are blessing each other and you are growing as part of the body of Christ? Uh-uh. One, if one does not love God, one is not motivated to love others. So check your relationship with God. How is it? How is it? Do you really love Him? Are you enjoying His love? Are you connected with Him? Because if you are, you will be motivated to love others. And secondly, if one loves God, he will love his brother. Not he might or he could, he will love his brother. So I'm going to, it sounds so simple, doesn't it? Oh, if we just love God, we'll all get along great. It's not quite as simple as that. Because to love God means that God has to make a change in our lives. And he's going to make a change in other people's lives. And get this. If I have offended you and you feel like you need to connect with me and tell me that I've offended you, 
realize that God's going to be making a change in your life and my life. Not just one person. He's not just going to change me. He's going to change you too. Because the body grows together. So if all of a sudden I start, you know, I, I realize I've offended you and I repent and I seek forgiveness, if that doesn't change you, then you're a liar. See, because you're part of the body of Christ and if it doesn't change you, then how could it have changed me? Because we're part of the same body. So this idea of really coming together and understanding each other and discovering how we fit into what each other is to do within the body of Christ means that all of us grow when all of us grow. But we all suffer when one of us suffers. I ask this now for two Sundays in a row. Brian, you don't say a word. Any questions, comments, criticisms, or complaints? Really, seriously, do you have any questions or comments you'd like? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good observation. It's not a judgment. When you come before somebody, it's not really that you remember you're coming in humility. And it's it's redemption motivated by love. So it's not and, and you're right to make that observation. It's not that I'm passing judgment on somebody, it's that there's a there's a conflict, a difference of opinion. And it, we have differences of opinion. It's okay to have a difference of opinion. But the relationship, remember, is to be built on common ground and our love for God. And so that's where we begin. That's, you know, the, the fact of the matter is some of you will never agree with me on some things. But that doesn't mean that we can't have a right relationship. I mean, seriously, why, why do we assume that we cannot have a right relationship simply because you believe something that I don't? Or that I, that I act a way that, uh, that you just don't like? I love what Ben was telling me earlier. May I, may I share a little bit of that, Ben? Ben was sharing with me that when he started coming to class seven years ago that he didn't like me. I know that's hard to believe, but, uh, uh, but he said there was just, you know, that he, you know, he'd never really gotten to know me, and, and uh, he just, it, there were some things that, that he'd heard and other people had said things about, you know, he's not the only one that doesn't like me. And so he heard some things from other people. Said, "Well, that Dan Hurst, he's just you know he's you know he's arrogant and he he just does whatever he wants to and he's a rebel and yada 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 yada," and they're right. And um, uh, but he he really had some struggles with that. And they said just uh, it took a few years before God finally began to help him understand that. Listen, we're both in the body. God made him his way, and God made me my way, and we we have to understand that. We're part of each other. And sometimes one of us is sandpaper. And sometimes we're just two people who are just really, really meshed together and come together. So God's always in the process of growing the body. And the body doesn't grow except by stress. It doesn't. Faith doesn't grow except by stress. There's got to be conflict for faith to grow. And so there's going to be conflict in the body of Christ, but that's how it grows. We get those conflicts worked out. And now we like each other, sort of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Doris, by the way, so good to see you back. Doris was. Oh. Let, me, let me read something that I, it's in 1 Corinthians. I don't know, you might have heard this before. Uh, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. We can rejoice about that. That's something that we can all rejoice about. That's body life. Anything else? Anybody else have a question or a comment, a criticism? You, you wouldn't give me a criticism now for your life's sake, would you? 
Okay. All right, next Sunday, uh, we take a look at um, uh, uh, kingdom forgiveness. And we'll be spending two Sundays on looking at kingdom forgiveness, how that actually happens. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. You are a God that loves us. You are a God that has a purpose for each of us. And we can celebrate that, knowing that you're up to something in each of our lives. So, Father, encourage us, uh, encourage us to uh, seek the good for each other, to seek the best for each other. Encourage us to uh, put aside our differences and focus on our common ground and on you together. Then, Father, as you work those things out, be among us. Be among us. Show up in our presence, Lord, and uh, reveal yourself because we need that. We need to be motivated by you and by your presence in our lives. And so I'm asking you, Lord, to, to show up. I pray this in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Go away. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.